um, weak signal VHF, UHF operations and resources uh, presentation tonight by uh, Tino, VE6, uh, Mike Bravo, uh, and uh, looking forward to learning about uh, some ways to get uh, weak signal use of the equipment we've got. So Tino, take it away. All right, well, thank you. And I, I think I know either most of you or have met most of you in the past, a little bit of a background. I was licensed in 1995, initially as VE6SZR, Sierra Zulu Romeo. I still hold that call and then later switched to uh, VE6 uh, Mike Bravo, which was uh, Ken Martin's old call from central Alberta. I've, I've had that call since about uh, oh, 2010, give or take. So it's a lot faster than uh, the old letter combination, which is a, a bit of a tongue twister for sure. Um, I suppose as most people get into the hobby, because the equipment is usually the least expensive, you know, one invariably tends to get exposed to, to VHF and or UHF operation first and foremost. I guess that's natural. And, and for myself, it was a, a two meter HT at the time. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, advancing into, let's say, HF operation just didn't hold as much enjoyment for me. And I, I can't exactly tell you why. I, it, it just didn't. And uh, so I uh, quickly kind of discovered weak signal operating. And, and when we say weak signal, what do we mean by that, really? Well, I suppose in the case of VHF, you know, where you're dealing with, you know, repeaters and that, we mean really a, a direct station to station mode. So that can encompass, you know, FM simplex, CW, single sideband, uh, digital, of course, being uh, popular, these modes where it's station to station, hence weak signal. And, um, you know, I think you've, it's not for everybody. Uh, you know, I've heard uh, uh, comments in the past regarding, you know, VHF weak signal operation. When, when making the comparison to HF people, uh, I've had some comments where people will say, well, that's not, that's not operating or that's not contesting or whatever it is. So um, I guess we respectfully agree to disagree. Uh, I find that uh, for those of who have kind of caught that bug of, of enjoying to work weak signal, VHF, UHF, or above, uh, there you, you're pretty well diehard. There's some pretty strong uh, personalities in there. People, you, either you love it or you don't. And, and I suppose, given that traditionally VHF compared to HF, you know, the performance is, is it's it's a lot more difficult because traditionally you get less um, propagation. Uh, it's more of a challenge. So there's there's various reasons why people get into it. Again, whether it's the the technical challenge, the the challenge of you know trying to operate the best station you can. Some people now uh, collect grids. It's, it's common in the VHF and above world to, to work other stations in different uh, maidenhead grids, which would be those uh, one degree by two degree squares that, that are all over the globe. And, uh, and of course, certainly contesting. And it was mentioned certainly uh, this coming weekend is the, uh, the ARRL June VHF contest, one of three major ARRL VHF contests that, uh, that occurs through the year. And certainly this one coming this week in June, this is the big one because certainly the weather is the most favorable. Uh, traditionally, you'll find bands like the six meter band. Uh, propagation is open, making um, long distance contacts possible. And as we get into solar cycle 25 with, uh, uh, you know, maybe in another, you know, year or two where we might see some uh, F2 propagation, you might see some serious six meter propagation all over the world there. So I'm looking forward to that very much. So what I'd hope to do today was uh, talk a little bit about weak signal, um, answer questions that anyone might have, show you some resources that the, that the local uh, weak signal operator around Alberta has access to. These are online resources, either by way of uh, uh, like a Facebook group that's out there and, and some online group information to some online propagation tools that one can use to, to enhance your, your operating and to talk a little bit about some of the activities that are going on. Um, I'm also part of a group called the Southern Alberta VHF Society. It's not a club per se, it's more like a, a working group that, that combines a bunch of individuals together. And we are also sponsoring an award for weak signal operating. So that's something I could talk about. And then I wanted to also end off with, you know, uh, the contest 
uh, answer any questions you might have, talk about those that I'm aware of that are actively uh, planning some kind of uh, participation in that contest. So any questions so far? First of all, out of the group here, uh, those of you that I can see, I guess you can put a hand up those I can't and you can shout out, but does anyone or has anyone uh, really participated in, in, in weak signal VHF, UHF in, in any way, shape or form, uh, you know, whether a few years ago recently, or is I'm looking to try to find who's kind of, you know, not just doing the VHF repeater thing. Anybody who's a, who's a, Who's a, who's tried weak signal operation? Does Any show? Count? I'm sorry. I said, does attempting count? So attempting is fine. Sure. So any hands? Yeah, V six TC I have. Okay, sir. I knew that, Mike, but I, <laughs> I had to coax you out of your shell there just to uh, pipe in there. So, okay, fair enough. Well, for myself, again, it's it's one of those things that I just I just take a lot of joy in it. I mean, it uh, uh, again, you know, we're so used to using our HTs or mobiles into the repeater networks and 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 working that way. But there is an immense joy when you're when you're there, and uh, you know, whether it's on you know two meter single sideband, and you're talking to guys up in Edmonton or Gibbons or Lloydminster, or what have you, or or for that matter, on six meters where you know you've got uh, longer skip distances and you're working all over the continent um it's it's just one of those things i don't know I, I i take immense joy out of it anyways in alberta we we have a pretty good group a pretty pretty diverse but a pretty good group of people who uh who are of uh, similar enthusiasts and so what i'm going to do here first of all is i'm just going to get a uh, share a screen an alternate screen here just so that i can uh, present some items that we've got going out here and please tell me if and when you can see anything on the screen here. Is anyone seeing anything at this time? Sure, we've got a map with United States, Can Canada and uh, okay. And colors and... Okay, well, I just, first of all, I just wanted to make sure that I had it working. <laughs> so one uh, place I wanted to go to here, first of all, is there is a Facebook page here for the Alberta Week Signal Net. So every Sunday on two meter single sideband, uh, there is a net that operates at 10 a.m. local and also uh, at 20 hundred hours local as well. Uh, usually the morning uh, is, is the one that most people try to attend. But uh, for those of you who do have all mode capability and, and single sideband capable equipment for two meters for that matter, this is something you could try out here. So there's a net that's on and we get people checking in probably on average uh, in recent years, the, the, the participation level has really come up. So uh, probably about as many as 30 people uh, at a time. And this is all over uh, uh, Calgary, Red Deer, Edmonton, Gibbons, sometimes Rocky Mountain House, Lloyd Minster. Uh, we had a fellow who checked in via CW from Lethbridge this last, last week. So, um, so 10 hundred hours local. This is on the two meter single sideband calling frequency of 144.200 megahertz. And uh, again, starts at 10. And then as well, sometimes uh, people will congregate there again, 10 hour, or sorry, yeah, 10 hours uh, later at 20 hundred hours. And uh, we get a good group uh, of people going on there and checking in and experimenting this sort of thing. So there is a web page for this. It's on uh, Facebook as is shown here, Alberta Week Signal Net. And as well, we have a number of people who are making uh, comments on here, what's going on. And we could see here, certainly there's a comment here where they're already starting to talk about the, uh, the VHF contest that's coming out. So if you want to get uh, involved or in contact with persons who are uh, into the weak signal modes, uh, this is certainly one avenue for you and, uh, and a place that you can certainly check into. As well, uh, when there is activity going on, uh, a bunch of us usually will in real time talk to one another when, when we're working weak signal modes. And so there is a platform called the Slack chat room. Uh, Slack is, which is shown here, is um, I guess uh, um, an online collaboration application that's used both for business as well as private. And uh, in this case here, the Alberta Weak Signal that we operate uh, on the Slack system here. And, and here we have real-time messaging going on um, 
at any time of the day. So it's not uncommon either if we're on the net, we're, we're, we're talking back and forth, or maybe if we're, some of us are working on uh, six meter operations at the time, you know, and we're trying to coordinate perhaps, like maybe somebody's got a new station coming on and uh, they want to try out antennas and, and, and they're looking for people to kind of give reports. It's a tool that we can use to, to talk back and forth. There's also some interesting learning resources on here. I'm going to flip here on the left hand side under learning resources and we do have uh, situations here with some materials where people will post various videos and, and ongoings. Uh, for example, here we have K9LA solar, ind uh, solar indices and propagation. Uh, it's a presentation here from what's called the front range six meter group. So uh, this is a very valuable tool and helps you to, to talk in real time. Um, a couple of really popular propagation tools we use. Now, um, first of all, whether it's HF or VHF, how many here do any kind of digital, i.e. FT8 uh, digital? Is there anyone here doing that? Uh, Ralph, I know you put your hand up. Anyone else? I'm beginning to play with it on uh, VHF. And then once I get my uh, 20 meter antenna tuned up, I'll be playing with it on, uh, well, 20 meters. Okay. So certainly for those who are familiar with, with FT8 digital, which you'd, you'd have to almost be living in a shack for the last five years out of communication with people to, to not know of the, uh, the impact that digital has made since about I guess it's 2017 when uh, when FT8 really burst onto the scene. There, there's a host of different digital modes being used on both HF and, and VHF. FT8 is probably one of the most well-known, but there's certainly a bunch of others. And, uh, and certainly there are those who either hate it or love it. Uh, I mean, certainly, I, if you're the type of person who likes to uh, get on the air and, 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 and talk at length and rag chew, you're probably not going to like it very much. If, if instead uh, you want to uh, you know, get the best out of your equipment and antenna that you have, it certainly makes contacts uh, more possible. You know, contacts that maybe didn't work well on, on uh, you know, sideband or, or CW, like the, uh, what is available and capable in digital today is uh, quite frankly, absolutely amazing in terms of the, uh, the noise levels, uh, signal to noise ratios that uh, the software will operate. Well, one of the most popular software packages for digital is called WSJT or WSJTX. When you're operating that software, it uh, there's an option, oops, sorry, wrong one here. Uh, there's an option as far as checking it off so that when your station receives stations, it will upload a record of those those receptions or spots to a web page here called pskreporter.info. So I don't know if, you know, most are probably aware of it. Um, so if you've been running the, the software at all, uh, your software likely has been uploading its reception reports to this web page. And on this web page, one can, and I had it set to six meters at this time, but I'm, I'm just quickly going to change it here. Um, here we have a display currently showing uh, reception reports for all bands uh, sent or received by anyone uh, using FT8 for the last 30 minutes. And, and certainly by the color coding here, we see that the, the bulk of uh, yellow here is in fact actually 20 meters, but this tool can also be utilized to, to actually drill down onto a very specific band, hence the reason why I had six meters here and I'm gonna go back to it for a moment. Uh, we can see obviously a lot less activity here, but uh, valuable tool in terms of who's on, who can hear me, who I can hear, uh, these sorts of things, because it is uh, largely real time, fairly real time. You can change a number of the operating parameters up here. Uh, were most people aware of this, this tool, those of you who are on digital? Yeah, okay. So anyways, but very valuable tool nonetheless. Uh, another one which I had on here, uh, and first of all, I'm just going to pause maybe any questions thus far on anything that that I've talked about any any questions? Okay. So I had another tool loaded up here. Um, actually, I'm going to show you another one here. Again, this relates more so to VHF. So this is an interesting propagation tool. It's um, 
The uh, address here is aprs.menolink.org. And uh, the key here is the APRS. So APRS is uh, Automatic uh, Packet Reporting System. It's a uh, packet radio. And, and nowadays it's largely used for things like uh, um, GPS position reports and what have you. Uh, it's used a lot for uh, public service or, or people who wanna be tracked in their vehicle. But it also has another interesting purpose. Uh, with all of the stations that are on the air, you know, uh, sending off their packets, uh, somebody's turned around and said, hey, why don't we use that information to, uh, to show kind of what's happening with propagation? And uh, for the reasons of uh, tropospheric ducting, right? When the temperature goes up, and you have ducting occurring, which allows uh, VHF propagation to travel further. So on this webpage, aprs.menolink.org, and we can zoom in, I'm gonna zoom into our area here. Usually when you load up the page, it takes a moment and then these colors start to kind of blend in. And you can see perhaps as I'm moving my mouse uh, cursor around, it's highlighting some of these colors. And if I click on one, we see something going on here. So what these, uh, I'll call them balloons or clouds are, is they're showing kind of uh, APRS digital position reports uh, from, uh, in this case, the, the center of it here is a, uh, a packet digipeter. And it's, it's, it's plotting out lines showing the extent of the, uh, the transmissions, how far they're being received. So of course, as propagation increases, these clouds will get larger. And certainly as uh, you have uh, more frequency, they'll actually change in color. So here right now, the color being shown is like green. Um, when it get, things get really intense, those colors will change to warmer colors like yellow and then reddish. And um, if I go south a bit from Calgary here, yeah, here we go. Uh, let's say Billings, Montana, we can see here an example of kind of some warmer colors being shown here. And again, this is all data that is coming as a result of APRS packet data. But what it tends to show is where conditions of ducting are occurring. So uh, we've had times here, uh, for example, on say the Sunday morning net, where, uh, you know, we've got uh, a path here, you know, showing say from, from Calgary up to Fort McMurray and the color coding is fairly warm. And we've noticed that in real time, uh, conditions for uh, single sideband contacts, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's verified. We're seeing an increase in, in propagation uh, as a result of it. So it's a, it's a really interesting tool. You can kind of go wherever you want in the world here. But again, uh, here, if we go down, we can see here, of course, certainly over Texas and um, uh, Florida here, uh, there's obviously some intense propagation, uh, tropospheric events that are going on here as a result of uh, the APRS data that's being collected and generated here. So another interesting tool uh, in the arsenal here, as far as, you know, what might be open and, and where uh, you might be able to project or receive signaling uh, for, for weak signal modes. Any questions about any of this? Do you know, Tino, are they um, they just using the APRS IS network's feed or do they also have, uh, because um, that's going to remove duplicates, right? So that they're, they're waiting for a packet to get missed and received far, far away. I have to confess, uh, I mean, there is some information here, uh, some some options here at the bottom, but I, I can't profess to know, you know, all of the technical background of this particular item, um, to be honest. Uh, it's a good question, you know, as far as where are they getting their feed from and, and what kind of processing goes into it. Uh, I'm not aware of the full extent of it uh, at this time, but it, it has been shown for, you know, since I've been aware of it and some of us, uh, some of the others in the province who have discovered it, that, uh, you know, what we're seeing, you know, it's not always 100%, certainly, but we've certainly seen verification of, of, of what it's showing and, and its effect on the real world, what we're, what we're seeing. Does it, does it actually report the, the call sign of the, of the track signal or not? Yes, I, I, I'm just trying to think of here uh, where I've seen this here. There is, um, I had it here before and I'm just struggling because there was, there was something in here before. Maybe it's a right click here. Uh, I got to be honest with you. I, 
haven't used it in a while. And there was a point where it would show the actual call signs here. And I'm just struggling to remember. Bear with me. They're, they're uh, showing up as I mouse over the areas uh, in my display here. You're, you're seeing the, the letters? Yes, I am. Yeah. Oh, you, oh you know what? I think I know what it is. It's I one moment here. I just uh, activating because I have a Java JavaScript filter on here. There we go. So wow. it's, apologies. <laughs> So these are the what they call the tactical call sign names of the uh, the digipeters. So uh, these aren't the actual call signs, but uh, you know, El Nora, Red Deer, uh, Rocky Mountain House, uh, Alliance. So you can click on any of these balloons, and it'll kind of show you. So for example, this one here, this is all uh, relative reports from the Lloyd Minster digipeter versus, say, Alliance. Or if we click on another one here, which is Chipman. And uh, we can go up here as well. A Swan Hills, obviously, White Court, Evansburg, uh, Smoky Lake, and what have you. Okay. Good question. Any others? Uh, another one relating to tropospheric ducting again, uh, which I'm still, and that's this colorful one that we saw here earlier. So this is a French station, F5 uh, Lima Echo November. And we can see here, uh, if you go to his main web page, you'll, you'll get to the link here. I'm already into their forecast. But this gentleman here actually tries to use uh, weather reports for actual future forecasting. So versus, you know, what's happening right now, this is an actual forecasting uh, tool here. And so uh, one can certainly, you know, zoom in or zoom out to their area of interest. Um, of course, I, I had it on ours here. Uh, it's pretty rare. Of course, we're landlocked. So there's not always a lot of tropospheric um, forecasting modeling that happens in our area. In fact, this is kind of rare that it's it's saying that uh, it's predicting here on, uh, you know, uh, 10 of June at uh, uh, nine hours UTC, you know, this is what they're expecting, that there is a bit of an event going on here. Certainly not as intense as these other colors that you see here, but on this web page, one can go and choose, you know, uh, some, some dates and times in advance. Again, how, how is this being generated and, and, and what's the quality of it? Again, I, I won't say that um, in the time that I've used it, that it's been, you say, as solid as the, the other web page I just showed you, but um, there is something to it. You know, uh, I guess I'm, I'm still trying to learn the ins and outs of it, uh, but it's, it's another interesting tool in terms of being a predictor of tropospheric ducting events. Uh, and we can we can click another one here. I mean, I, I can zoom ahead to what what has he got here for prediction of uh, June the fourteenth at uh, three hundred hours UTC. We'll let that it takes a moment here to load, but then it will uh, load up with some some colors here. So these are just like oh here we go. So here we can see certainly more spotty events in in our corner of the world certainly, um, but a little bit certainly if we were you know near bodies of water where. Uh, there are uh, definite uh, temperature gradients uh, because, of course, they do occur closer to water. Uh, there'd be more to see here. But anyways, this is one I've uh, I discovered not too long ago. So I'm, I'm really trying to kind of try it out, use it a bit and, and see if I can kind of correlate, you know, uh, where it shows a distinctive event in our neck of the woods, you know, whether I actually see, you know, um, that occurring in real time. So uh, I'll let you know, but uh, it's an interesting tool nonetheless. Um, one other item I'm going to show here. Uh, so I mentioned earlier um, a little bit of a backgrounder again, and, and I guess I should ask uh, how much time do we have here typically? Are we, tr we try to wrap up here by what, uh, 8.30? Is that the, the goal? Yeah, that would be uh, if I'm kind okay. of, well, yeah, we started a little bit late, so uh, <laughs> if we want to carry on a little bit longer, that's fine. All right. We've, we've gone till nine o'clock with programs, and then uh, we had a few of us stayed on one night for another hour or two after that. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier a um, 
a loosely put together group that I'm involved with uh, is called the Southern Alberta VHF Society. It was a, it was just kind of conceived as a bit of a, uh, a meeting of the minds working group to get people of, of similar interest in weak signal VHF and UHF operation to, to come together because it seems like uh, activity in, on that front uh, has kind of uh, waxed and waned through the years. When I got into the hobby, uh, I didn't realize it at the time, largely because, you know, especially all mode equipment is more expensive than FM equipment. And uh, I think back then, you know, my, uh, my Radio Shack HTX 202 handheld radio was $400. Uh, so, you know, it was pretty, pretty, pretty pricey back then. And so, you know, the, the prospect of getting into some of the all mode equipment and that I just, I couldn't afford it at the time, given uh, my age and, and what I was doing for work at the time. So, but I, I'm told that back then there was a pretty robust group of people who were weak signal enthusiasts. And then that slowly kind of died out after a time. Um, who knows? I guess there's a lot of diversions in the hobby. Uh, lots of places you can certainly spend your money on equipment and tennis and what have you. And uh, anyways, the activity kind of died off, but there was a, a bit of a rekindling and uh, a bunch of people who we discovered were, were very interested in, and kind of, you know, we wanted to promote that activity again. So that is what this web page is here I have. So this is the groups.io web page. This is uh, not unlike Yahoo groups and some of these other um, group web pages where one can go and form uh, an email list server if you want to uh, uh, promote a, another hobby or facet of the hobby. So we're using this platform to promote weak signal activity. And again, the name of, uh, of our group is called the Southern Alberta VHF Society. Uh, it's not really limited to Southern Alberta, but largely Alberta amateurs and on here we probably have about 50 to 60 people uh, spread throughout the province and uh, we communicate via email via this messaging system all sorts of ongoings uh in the weak signal world uh we we like to talk about contests who's uh, who's building antennas who's installing a new station um you know what what we're doing what's going on um coordination towards you know meeting up at the uh, the red deer picnic all in those years where they're they're holding it certainly all of the activities you know have taken a hit with with covid and, and social distancing we're sure hoping that uh, of course that's slow you know slowly going to get behind us and we can uh, meet up more in, in person but uh, uh great tool here uh that we use here uh, there's also um on the main web page here um, some for sale uh, listings for equipment if people are looking for, you know, particular equipment. Uh, this is a, a sign up is required if you want to join this. You have to have a profile on groups.io that anyone can certainly create a profile. And then you just need to uh, ask to join because we do keep this list uh, closed for local participation, Alberta. One of the things the Southern Alberta VHF Society has strived to do in, in promoting weak signal activity is we've come up with an award uh, for uh, this year. Um, and what we're trying to do, there's, there's a couple of things we're trying to achieve with it. Um, we wanna promote weak signal activity. We'd like to promote operation from the field. Uh, we'd like to promote lesser used frequency bands. Uh, so i.e anything from say 220 megahertz and, and higher. And uh, so what we've done is uh, we've sponsored a weak signal award for the longest um, weak signal or, or station to station contact on any band 220 megahertz and higher, okay? There's some, uh, some caveats and some rules that you have to abide by. There's some power limits, 25 watts maximum. Uh, obviously being weak signal mode, no repeaters, no satellites, it's, it's direct station to station mode, any propagation method, any mode, i.e. FM, single sideband, CW, digital, you name it. Um, the, the kicker here though is in order for your QSO to qualify potentially for the award, one of the two stations in the QSO has to be either portable, remote, or mobile. So, you know, the other station can be a fixed station at home, but, but one side of that QSO contact has to be, uh, like I said, mobile, remote, portable. And um, first prize is a $200 gift card from uh, Radio World Calgary. And uh, second prize is a $100 gift card from Radio World Calgary. 
uh, where you have uh, two eligible operators on the queue. So the prize is split because the award is only open to uh, Alberta licensed individuals, uh, no club stations, individuals only, has to be an Alberta station. Uh, one half of the QSO has to either originate or end in Alberta, but, the, but you can certainly make a, an Alberta to say, let's say Saskatchewan contact that would, that would qualify, but only the Alberta station would be uh, eligible for the award. So this award is, uh, which started uh, May 1st, runs to the end of the year. Uh, so we uh, will receive, of course, all claims for the award and see, uh, see who emerges or which stations emerge as, uh, as uh, first and second place. But the, the idea is to see what's possible and uh, what people are doing. And there's a lot of people uh, who, as of late, are getting engaged more on some of these other unused frequency bands. Um, certainly, a lot of people have two meter, 70 centimeter, uh, six meters. Those are probably the big three in terms of what, what people actually uh, have capability for. But in recent years, partially due to the emergence of um, equipment that's readily available, for example, um, like ICOM released in 2019, the, uh, the IC9700 radio, which is an all mode um, two meters, 70 centimeter and 23 centimeter, which is 1.2 gig uh, capable radio. There are a number of people who own that radio in Calgary. Um, similarly, by way of transverters, that's another way. Uh, there's a, a number of products being fielded, uh, one of them being uh, from Bulgaria. There's a company called SG Lab who produce uh, 900 meg, uh, 1.2 and 2.4 transverters. And they're, they're very, very reasonably priced. Uh, they're about in the 200 to 250 US dollar mark. And, and that's opened up some, some doorways and pathways. Um, 23 centimeter has probably exploded as of late in terms of uh, uh, the number of people who now find themselves on that new band. And it may be interesting to note, but in Calgary, we actually have a 1.2 gigahertz analog repeater. Uh, it's being operated by uh, Mike Foreman, V6 Alpha, Mike Charlie. And uh, as well, too, there's uh, no less than one, two, three, four, five, 900 megahertz repeaters in the, the Calgary and surrounding areas. So th we're seeing some activity going on there with some of these other uh, frequency bands out there. Any questions about the award itself? Okay. If anyone is interested, um, and I can make my email address known. Uh, you can drop me a line. I can point people to the Southern Alberta VHF Society webpage if, if, uh, if you'd like to get involved and at least, you know, maybe participate. The rules uh, and uh, application for that award is uh, available from that webpage as well. Uh, I, sorry, go ahead. My compliments to you and a couple other fellows that keep that uh, page very active. We try, <laughs> but uh, there's a, uh, you know, I think, I think we should all kind of hold our heads high. The, um, just from what I've seen and the people who participate, uh, Alberta has some pretty impressive uh, uh, people, some, some, let's call them local celebrities who do some amazing things uh, in the weak signal world. Case in point, uh, like look at EME for that matter. Okay, Earth, Moon, Earth. Um, uh, there's at least two people who are on our list there who are supremely active. Uh, one being Skip McCauley, V6 uh, Bravo Golf Tango in Lacombe, and the other one uh, being uh, Grant, that I can't remember Grant's last name now all of a sudden, VE6 Tango Alpha, and he's in Edmonton. And they are both uh, imminently active on uh, EME on a number of different bands. Uh, Skip is a, just an incredible fabricator. He, uh, he built his own 21 foot dish uh, with multiple feeds for a whole host of different uh, uh, bands and microwaves and operates uh, EME. Um, yeah, really, uh, really good group of people there with a lot of knowledge. And uh, certainly, yeah, if a person's looking to, to get an impression or an opinion or, or some help in some way, it's a, it's a great resource to jump on there and, and uh, let people know what you're doing or ask some questions if, if, if need be. Any questions about that? Um, just looking at the time, the last thing I wanted to touch on was the VHF contest. 
so um you know certainly operating is is you know the 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 main reason why we we do what we do but uh, in uh, for those of us who have a bit of a competitive streak uh vhf contest is is one way to certainly uh you know get your fill of that competitive streak and to try out your station and then uh, you know i'll be honest i i like giving my equipment a run and it's always during the contests when uh, everything's going haywire that you discover very quickly you know what uh, what does work what doesn't work or, or what you didn't know was wasn't working at the time and and so it, it is very much a baptism by fire and i enjoy it immensely um, we do have a number of people, especially for this weekend, who are planning expeditions away from home. Uh, I plan on going to, and now that I know that the weather is going to be fine, I guess I should say that originally the weekend wasn't looking so great for the forecast, but, uh, but now it is. Uh, I plan on operating from uh, Moose Mountain, just west of Calgary in Kananaskis country, because of course it affords uh, great altitude, and uh, I'll be operating on... Uh, uh, all bands from six meters uh, right up to 1.2 gig. I'll have uh, uh, equipment running on all bands. Uh, we're aware of some people who are going to be at the um, Alberta Saskatchewan border in the Hardesty area. We've got people who are planning expeditions in the uh, Cypress Hills area. And uh, certainly one group which uh, has really enjoyed, you know, the exposure of weak signal. And now with the Weak Signal Ward is the SOTA group, SOTA being summits on the air. It's a, it's a, I guess, a, a subset of uh, amateurs who, uh, who go on expeditions and they operate from the field from various peaks across the province. And given that the Weak Signal Award requires one station in the CUSO being a remote station, those guys have a bit of a leg up, right? Because they're operating remote, their CUSOs automatically qualify, and certainly um, they are sought after stations by those who are working from home because you need a remote station in order to get in on, a, on the potential for an award. Anyways, um, so this weekend it's the ARRL VHF, June VHF contest. It runs from local uh, Saturday noon to Sunday night uh, just before 9 p.m. So that's, uh, uh, I guess, what is it, 20, 2059 hours. And the goal is to work as many stations on as many different bands uh, above, you know, from six meters and above. Uh, and exchanging uh, different uh, grid squares, okay? Uh, in these contests, typically, uh, you don't have to give an exchange of uh, signal report, it's optional. The main thing is you exchange your, co your, your call sign and whatever uh, maidenhead grid you are working from with your other station and they do the same with you. Uh, each contact per band can only be made once. So for example, if you work a particular station uh, let's say somebody's working myself, the six Mike Bravo on, uh, let's say 70 centimeter, and you've worked me once on, let's say FM, uh, working me again on single sideband or digital or what have you uh, is no benefit. Uh, you can only work the same sta station once per band, regardless of mode. The only exception to that is there is a very specific class of stations called uh, mobile or rover stations. These are designed to travel from grid to grid to grid. They may be worked, obviously, uh, multiple times, but the key there is uh, once per band per the same grid. So you could work the same station on the same band as long as they move to a different grid. And so they get the advantage of being able to, to uh, collect points as a result of moving from grid to grid to grid. Um, what else was I going to say about that? So anyways, June. June is the most popular uh, contest out of the three. It actually operates three times a year in uh, January, June, and September. Uh, June is the most popular, again, because of the weather being the most favorable, typically. And some bands like six meters, this is the time of year that the six meter, also known as the magic band, is very active, right? Right alongside, uh, you know, as you approach the summer solstice and, and thereafter. Um, although there is also a, a smaller, not as uh, strong opening that occurs in December as well. I might point that one out as well. But right now, uh, I've been active on six meters, for example, since April. I mean, I literally watch it daily. 
And, uh, you know, I, I am in the process of uh, collecting grids worked on the six meter uh, uh, band. Uh, I have a, I did get my VUCC award, which is for uh, um, VHF, UHF uh, Century uh, Club. And uh, the minimum requirement to get that award is 100 worked grids. I think I'm up to uh, 294 for six meters. Uh, my goal right now is to try to work all 488 contiguous grids in the United States on six meters. Uh, there actually is an award for that called the uh, Fred Fish Memorial Award. It's named after uh, W5FF Fred Fish, who was the first person who ever worked all 488 grids in the continental US. He did it first. And uh, now I think we're up to 15 in total who have now accomplished it. But the, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, the number two man who, who followed in his footsteps, it took 10 to 15 years after Fred Fish did it first before somebody could follow in his footsteps. Now with the, uh, the emergence of digital, it is a little easier than it used to be. So uh, there are others who are now uh, joining in on that. Um, is there anything I can add or uh, answer about the operation of, of say the VHF contests? Uh, the AWRL contests are not the only VHF contest. CQ also has one that occurs. I think it's usually uh, only on six meters and two meters. And, and then certainly some of our other events, i.e. field day. Um, and I think even the, 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 the RAC contest have a provision for working, I believe, at least six meters, if not possibly two meters as well. But the VHF award or VHF contest uh, do very much promote all bands from six meters right on up to microwaves and, and, and light. Unfortunately, we're in a portion of the, the country where we don't have uh, a huge population and, and therefore uh, the levels of activity that you would see in say, you know, Toronto or Montreal for that matter. But uh, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's some increases in activities uh, that have been um, going on here in the last few years. So uh, anything I can uh, add about the, the contest and, and operating a contest for that matter. Just to a quick question here is that some of those VHF bands are pretty broad and where do you find the uh, signals to work? Are there some designated specific frequencies or, or you just search across the whole band for contacts? Excellent question. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, one thing I'm going to do here is go to the AWRL uh, webpage. Uh, just reminded me that I should point out uh, where one can find um, some information here. And I guess that's one thing on my mind and I'll get to your question very much so. Um, let's do this differently here actually. Uh, oh, this is the best way. So first thing I will say, uh, of course, on the AWRL webpage, you're going to find information about the contest and all the contest rules. When does it run? Uh, the actual times expressed in UTC, um, discussion about um, the rules, the submissions, the points, how to submit your log, etc. Now to get back to your question, where do you find activity? Well, of course, that's certainly going to depend on what mode you're going to operate. Um, if it's on, and this is where, of course, the, you know, the, the Canadian and the RAC band plan for each of the different bands is going to be your friend. Uh, but certainly, I'll just use two meters as a really good example because most people are familiar with it. Uh, but say for two meters, for that matter, if you're going to operate FM simplex, well, then your, your common simplex frequencies are going to be where you're going to want to park yourself. Uh, 146.52 or decimal 55 or decimal 58, although you're not limited to those, but those are the most common. Uh, interesting to note that at one time, the FM calling frequency was prohibited at one time where you, you could not use that frequency. That rule was changed ooh, at, least, at least two to three years ago. So that is eligible to be used. If you're going to be on say something like single sideband, then there is a single sideband calling frequency. 144.200 megahertz is where you would, you would want to camp out and look at that. Um, so our band plans are the best source. And I mean, I can certainly uh, bring one up here to beater rack band plan. Let's look at that one here. 
Uh, interesting to note that uh, the two meter band plan was just updated very recently. In fact, I think the date might even be on here. I'm trying to see if, uh, like in the last year, I'm just seeing if they have a date that this was valid here. I can't tell here, but uh, at least, oh, I forgot we had at least four to six people who were on the steering committee who, uh, who produced this are actually on the Southern Alberta VHF Society. Uh, there's at least four of the members on there who have input on this. Anyways, here is the, the band plan. So uh, again, you'll have your various areas where you can look up, you know, like CW. Um, CW is common uh, in, in weak signal work, still is to this day, and, and it's extremely effective. Uh, so don't discount that. But whether it's CW, single sideband, if it's FM, there are segments and frequencies here. You're, you're going to want the various calling frequencies. Um, there is also FT8 digital being operated as well. And uh, you'll find that, uh, and it's actually marked here. I, I actually found it right here. This, this document's been updated, so it's easier. So two meter FT8 is right here, 144.174 is your dial frequency for your radio if you're on that. Uh, similarly, we can go to the, the six meter band plan for that matter. And I'm going to bring that up. I'm just using you know Google search to bring up the document quickly because it's easiest. So uh, here is the band plan. Now this one here has been active or has been unchanged since I believe 1997. I don't believe it's been updated since. But uh, common frequencies here are going to be uh, for single sideband. You've got here the national SSB calling frequency on 50.125. Uh, if you're in the FM portion of the band, uh, it's right here. National FM calling frequency 52.525. Uh, if you're doing FT8 digital, I'm, I'm hitting most of the major ones here. I'm just trying to see if they listed. It's not listed on here, but the, the default is uh, 50 decimal 313. That's usually loaded by default in the WSJT digital software. Usually you can find it there, but there's a host of resources there to, to kind of tell uh, where you should be. Did that answer your question? Yeah, perfect, thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, the other thing too, you kind of have to temper with the fact that again, we're in Calgary, we're in Alberta. Uh, again, I mentioned that we don't have the same levels of activity that would be found in major metropolitan areas. So I'm, and I'm sure I could just, I could call on Mike Ross to, to talk about that, about his experience out East and, and what a difference it is to, to work a contest down there. But, you know, here your common bands are going to be, you know, the big three, six meters, two meters, and 70 centimeter. Uh, to some degree, there will be people who have 220 megahertz capability, but probably largely on FM because it's not as common to find all mode equipment on 220. Um, there's been a recent um, increase or uptick in 900 megahertz, the 33 centimeter band. And that's largely because of the availability of uh, you know, old X commercial radios. Again, that's largely probably going to be FM uh, only around here. Uh, but then there, of course, then you get uh, 23 centimeter, 1.2 gig. There are quite a few people now who do definitely have uh, all mode capability on that band. Any other question about the, the contest? Tino, uh, as I'm not necessarily interested in competing in the contest, but can I be a, uh, a contact for people uh, if I have some time to turn on the radio and, and do returns? Do I need to uh, submit my contacts for them to be validated? Um, or just having a contact, is that enough? So excellent question. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, certainly, again, uh, I guess the, the moral of that story is not everyone is is uh, desires to be a competitor. Uh, so therein, yes, being available in some way, shape or form, if one can with whatever equipment you have on, you know, FM simplex sideband or otherwise is, is very much appreciated and desired. Uh, you don't need to submit a log, although Certainly, if you wanted to, I don't think anyone would uh, 
would uh, be offended by it. You don't even have, you can even choose to submit a log as a, a check log. That is one not to be uh, scored per se, but just as a, as a check. But I don't believe it's a, it's a requirement. Um, and, and yes, um, I, I would say in, in the key to, to success in increasing participation levels for the contest is to is to get the word out and that's part of the reason why uh, I guess I agreed to come here today to, to talk a little bit about this to increase people's awareness and say that hey uh, appreciate that this might not be your thing but there are some people out there who would who would very much be be pleased to to work you um, all you need to know is when you're giving out a contact is what your maidenhead grid is um, there is a place where you can uh, find it if you don't know it already. Calgary, of course, is in a unique position of having a, a major populated area right at the intersection of four grids in Calgary. Um, so those grids are uh, Delta Oscar 20 and 21 and Delta Oscar 30 and 31. Uh, I'm in Southwest Calgary, which is typically Delta Oscar 20. The... Uh, uh, let's just say loosely the the northwest is is delta oscar um, 21 and then on the northeast side we have uh, delta oscar 31 and in the southeast generally speaking we have delta oscar 30. the actual intersection of those four grids is actually uh barlow trail which is the 114th um not Meridian, yeah, yeah, Meridian, excuse me, 114th Meridian and approximately 61st Avenue Southeast. That's approximately where that intersection is. In fact, uh, I think it's accessible via, uh, for those of you who know the industrial area of town, Ogdendale Road, it's uh, very close to the, uh, the access to uh, um, one of the rail yards uh, down in the area. So uh, you would need to know your grid, i.e. where, where you are. And if you, if you choose to, because there are those who, who jump in their cars and want to give out contacts that way. Well, again, the challenge being you would need to know what grid you are in at that particular time. And you would sign your call sign with Rover. Okay, so in my case, if I was a Rover station and, and I'm responding to someone or working somewhere, you know, I would say VE6 Mike Bravo Rover. And when I log that or stations are logging that, they would log, log that with a stroke R for rover station because the rover stations are the only ones who can make contacts in multiple grids. Hopefully that, uh, that answered your question. Yes, thank you. No worries. So th that's about, uh, I guess we're getting kind of late here. That's about all I wanted to cover off here. Uh, I mean, certainly we could expand easily. Uh, so I wanted to present a bit more of a high level of, you know, weak signal operating, what's going on, um, who's operating, uh, where one can find out more information, what tools are available, or, or, or where you can go to, to get help, advice, or encouragement to try it yourself, and uh, to make, aware, make people aware of events like the, uh, the June VHF contest, uh, uh, that uh, make people aware of uh, these events that are coming around. And in this case, this coming weekend. So I thank you. Thank you very much, Tino, for uh, agreeing to come on. I think I tracked you down by seeing the uh, Southern Alberta contest. And uh, I couldn't find you, so I went to a source that uh, I know and I uh, got hold of Vince, and uh, he let me know who, where you were and we got together. So I appreciate you uh, agreeing to uh, share some ideas with us tonight. No worries. Thank you.